Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the FIR that the CBI has filed against Chanda Kocher, formerly the CB, CEO of ICICI Bank, her husband Deepak Kocher and Vedugopal Dhut of Videocon. Parunjai, this is a first scam of the scale in a private sector bank. Could you explain to the people, our viewers, what does this scam really mean? What are the contours of this? What is it that CBI is now claiming has happened? Let's give a little bit of a background to this entire episode. It concerns a series of transactions, financial transactions, which are very complex in nature, that took place between 2008 and 2013. Who were the players? The players were companies that were controlled and owned by Mrs. Chanda Kocher's husband, Deepak Kocher, and other relatives. It also relates to various companies that were controlled by or are a part of a group of companies, the Videocon group of companies, which is headed by Mr. Venugopal Dhut. Now, the story can be summarized in a few sentences. What was earlier perceived to be uh, acts of alleged impropriety, at worst conflicts of interest or sweetheart deals. According to the Central Bureau of Investigation, that these are, doesn't stop there. The CBI's first information report, which was lodged on the 23rd of January, alleges that Mrs. Kocher and others conspired. There was a criminal conspiracy to defraud and cheat the bank of 1,730 crore till March 2012. And the allegations that have been leveled against her are allegations under the Indian Penal Code and the Prevention of Corruption Act. The Central Bureau of Investigation, the CBI, had lodged what is called a preliminary inquiry on the 8th of December 2017. More than a year later, that is on the 23rd of January 2019, this first information report has been lodged or registered, if you like, and subsequently, the next day, 24th of January, raids have been conducted on various establishments and firms in Mumbai and in Aurangabad connected to both Mr. Deepak Kocher and his associates as well as Mr. Venugopal Dhut and his firms. So essentially, to cut a long story short, this whole episode has been, has been around for a long time. It started with a whistleblower Arvind Gupta, who sent letters, he's a shareholder of ICICI Bank, he sent letters to various people, including the Prime Minister of India. But none of this really entered the public domain until the Indian Express published a detailed report on the 29th of March 2018. Subsequently, what happened was that Mrs. Kocher, who was the then chief executive officer and managing director of ICIC Bank, which, by the way, is the third largest bank in India after the two public sector banks, the State Bank of India and the Punjab National Bank, that Mrs. Kocher went on leave on the 18th of June and she formally resigned on the 4th of October 2018. She was looked on as a kind of a poster girl yeah, or a poster woman of Indian banking. Before yeah, you get yeah, to yeah. that, Paranjay, what was the reaction of ICICI itself? Because this is really first and foremost an issue which the board of ICICI had to react to. What did they do? Okay. The initial reaction soon after the Indian Express report came out was to give her a clean chit. Say, saying, saying that she has, according to the ICICI board, not done anything wrong. I mean, to sub summarize what the board said. But now... What the CBI is alleging is that she was actually a part of a committee which sanctioned loans, which went to the Videocon group 
and thereafter indirectly allegedly traveled to companies controlled by her husband That's and these are which are the this, which companies are these first in 2012 the videocon group received loans worth approximately 40000 crore rupees from a consortium of banks 20 banks led by the state bank of india out of this amount a sum of 3250 crores came from icici bank less than 10% of of the total amount but significantly almost 86% of this amount that was loaned to the videocon group that is 2810 crore remains unpaid or what you would describe is become a non performing asset now what happened is and this is the circumstantial evidence which is pretty pretty damning okay the sanctioning committee which included chanda kocher approved a loan various loans to the videocon group allegedly in contravention of the bank's own rules and own regulations the loans were dispersed the very next day what you found that the videocon group gave another loan to new power renewables through a company called supreme energy as a result of which the new power renewables acquired its first power plant this company was owned by mr deepak kocher that's correct and his relatives but it was Six months after Videocon had got the loans, but the dispersal—you know—from the time the loans are sanctioned to the time the loans are dispersed—that was the seventh of September two thousand and eight. All this happened. Yes. Now, what is happening is some very very curious developments have happened. Mr. Dhut and his firms and his associates transferred their ownership. in a company called supreme energy that gave a loan of 64 crores to new power which is controlled by mr deepak kocher to a trust headed by mr deepak kocher for a paltry sum of 9 lakh rupees so obviously there was something happening which was more than met, i mean i mean i, mean, I, mean, I would say Shall very, we say very, very murky doing very very unusual yes in financially very unusual yeah. shall we say probably there's one other thing i need to say the cbi me probe the role played by other members of this committee this dispersing committee who are very very important people let me list their names i'm not making any accusation but this is all based on the central bureau of investigation india's premier police investigating agency their first information report who are these individuals their role in this entire affair may be probed one mr sanjoy chatterji the chairman and co chief executive officer of the goldman sachs group in india the huge big financial services conglomerate international conglomerate ms zarin rather uh, unfortunate involvement in the one mdb scandal in malaysia goldman sachs asia was one of the key players shall we say that and their office officers are and, under and, and the new york times has brought out more exposes Wall about Street the yes started it and they are under, currently under uh, criminal charges okay so besides mr shonjoy chatterji uh, who is chairman and co ceo of goldman sachs group in india there's ms zareen daruwala he is she is the chief executive officer of standard chartered bank in india again a large international bank Then there are group companies. Mr. Sandeep Bakshi, who is the current CEO of ICICI Bank, uh, Mr. N. S. Kannan, who is the CEO of ICICI Prudential Life Insurance, and we have two persons who are connected with the Tata Group. We have Mr. Rajiv Sabarwal, who is the CEO of Tata Capital, and another director of ICICI Bank, Mr. Homi or Homai Khusro Khan. who is an advisor to the tata group he is also was part of this committee and importantly the gentleman who in a sense groomed mrs chanda kocher to succeed him the former chairman of the icici bank that's mr k v kamath who happens to be the president of this international bank called the new development bank which in its 
earlier avatar was known as the BRICS Development Bank. BRICS is the acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. It's loosely called the BRICS Bank. That's oh. correct. The, its official name is the New Development Bank. So only time will tell what happens, uh, how deep that probe would be. And I need to mention one other point. A former judge, a retired judge of the Supreme Court, Justice B. N. Sri Krishna, he had been asked by the board of ICICI to also submit a report and look into these allegations. And that report is yet to come. That is independent of the CBI's uh, probe. Obviously, when we're dealing with a bank, we are not dealing with private shareholders' money. We are dealing with depositors' money. That is the primary issue, that the bank does not by itself have a huge fund. The bank really gets money from its depositors, which it then loans to others. And the income the bank derives is out of the interest. It charges those whom it lends. So the money doesn't come back. It's really what the depositors are going to either take a hit or the risk is to the bank itself, which we have seen also in a number of other banks. Now, therefore, what is the responsibility of the regulators who are supposed to look after the banks? Who are the regulators? What are the responsibilities? And what did they do? Now, here, one has to probe deeper to find out why what was perceived to be conflicts of interest, alleged acts of impropriety or sweetheart deals, became a criminal conspiracy to cheat the bank. And what was the role played by the country's central bank, that is the Reserve Bank of India? What was the role that needs to be paid by the regulator of the financial markets, that is the SEBI or the Securities and Exchange Board of India? And above them all is the Ministry of Finance, North Block in Delhi, as you rightly pointed out. It is a private bank. It's the third largest bank in India. It's the biggest private bank, but its ownership may be private, and, and including foreign companies, but it has shareholders in India who are members of the public. And above all, it gets its money from depositors in this country. I mean, that's what banks do. So despite the ownership being private, clearly there is a very deep public interest involved when if these banks are accused of, or allegations, serious allegations are level of uh, the funds that at the end of the day belong to the public, belong to the depositors, are, are not being utilized in a, a proper manner and that adequate due diligence is not being done. And worse, criminal conspiracies to favor relatives, spouses, and so on and so forth. In fact, the All India Bank officers have charged that why is it that when you are willing to take immediate action against senior officials of the public sector banks, why were you so soft on essentially uh, private sector banks, which also are public? They are not, they're really public institutions of a certain kind. Therefore, why did you treat them differentially? And the whole question, therefore, of the regulatory structure in this country particularly because the financial structure underpins a large part of the economy. So and it's and not and just and I think what private issue. This entire episode highlights is that corruption or sweetheart deals or acts of impropriety or conflicts of interest or downright allegations of criminal conspiracy which violate the Indian Penal Code, the Prevention of Corruption Act, all these allegations not a prerogative of the public sector or government-owned financial institutions, uh, very much happening in private institutions or privately owned and privately controlled institutions. As you know, the Goldman Sachs case, which we were discussing in Malaysia, cases have been filed both in Singapore, in Malaysia, and also the United States, because Goldman Sachs, again, has responsibilities that go beyond its so sort of uh, the managing uh, trust managing uh, group of partners, so to say, because they're dealing with everybody else's money as well. So these are important issues, which uh, you, not you know, only play India yes. but also other countries. You know what what we have to probe and what we have to sort of look at. The whistleblower, Mr. Arvind Gupta, told ANI that he did what he did as a shareholder. 
and therefore he wanted what was happening to be known. Secondly, he has said that he would like the government to probe deeper into the foreign funding of Indian companies. I presume also an ICICI Bank. And he has further claimed that this may just be the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Gupta had also written to the Prime Minister, we'll have to wait and watch and see how deep the CBI probe would go. And uh, let's see. I mean, I can't second guess or double guess and uh, what will happen from here. Thank you very, very much, Parajay, for being with us. Exploring an issue which is not so easily understood because finance, as you know, and these large numbers generally blows people's minds. This is all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching News Click. We'll come with this and other such issues before you.